What really happened in the Toronto revival, or as some people call it, the Toronto blessing? Was it God? Was it a move of God? Is it even important? Well, Kate and I want to invite you into our experience as you listen to Alan Didio asking us all about the Toronto blessing and our prayer. May you too be filled with the love of God as we share our story. We study revivals, we love revivals. But when it comes to revival history, there's one revival that no one speaks of from that camp, and it's the Toronto Blessing. Oh, really? Because of the strange, the only thing we know are the strange manifestations that took place. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get to any of that, take it back, start from the beginning, and let's keep it in that context. These are people who know nothing about Toronto, good or bad. Yeah. 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 Can you give us a just a summary of what was the revival that took place yeah. in Toronto, Canada. On January the 20th, 1994, Randy Clark had been invited by John Arnett. John and Carol Arnett were the um, founding pastors of the Toronto Airport Vineyard Christian Fellowship. At that time, a church that uh, was approximately six years old They'd started it in 87, 88 in John Arnott's mother's basement. And um, the the church, though, had grown to about 300 people. Um, And around about 19, uh, somewhere in the early 90s, let's say, um, maybe 91, 92, the Lord had spoken to John and Carol and said, if you'll give me your mornings, and if you will uh, go to every person that's moving in my power and ask them to lay hands on you, Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing it, you know, um, you will have what you're asking me for, which is that the Lord would move really, really powerfully. Mm -hmm. And they'd already planted a church in Stratford, Ontario. Um, Both of them were divorcees. So they were, they had written themselves off before they planted a church. They wrote themselves off. Mm. Uh, we're just going to be business leaders. We love God. Everything that we thought, you know, our lives were going to go like didn't go the way that we mm. thought. And now we're disqualified. Um, but they had gone to Indonesia and um, in 1979. And God used them so powerfully for a month in Indonesia. And Assemblies of God pastor had invited them. Um, and they, they thought that it was sort of invited to their vacation. But when they arrived, they found out they were the guest speakers. <laughs> and they spoke nonstop for a month. And John always laughs. He said, I only had one sermon. But, you know, God used them so powerfully in remote Indonesia. And when they were on the airplane on the way back, they were both weeping, undone. And they were like, we cannot go back to our lives the way we were. We have to give our lives mm. for the gospel, for mm-hmm. Jesus and the gospel. And... Uh, as John was thinking about this on the airplane, he felt the Lord say to him, I want you to plant a church in Carol's hometown, which at that time they were living in Toronto. Well, Stratford, Ontario, an hour and a half, a rural place, an hour and a half outside of Toronto. God asked them to plant their first church there, which they started. And they started it in a snooker club. And what is a snooker club? Like a pool club. Like billiards. Like, oh, you know, okay. the, like the, 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 gotcha. the, um, the sport. And, and that meant that because they had said, oh, so I forgot to say that John's response to the Lord on the airplane was, Lord, who would want to come to our church? Hmm. We're both divorcees. And at that time in the se- late 70s, the church was not kind mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. the no, notion yes. of, of divorce among no. pastors. And one could say for good reason in the sense that, you know, God hates divorce and, you know, the standard is not divorce. The standard is healthy marriage all our lives. And so, you know, John and and Carol, but the reality is, is that we can use that to disqualify ourselves when God actually Mm. is the one who qualifies us, not on account of our righteousness, but on account of his righteousness. Mm -hmm. And so... John said, Lord, how could I uh, possibly plant a church? And uh, the Lord said to him uh, through a friend, when he got back home, he was telling his friend and mentor, I'm going to plant a church. His mentor said, 
well, what's stopping you? And he said, well, I'm Carol and I had both divorced and remarried. And he said, well, aren't 50% of the world's population divorced? And he said, yeah. He said, well, go after that half of the population. Hmm. <laughs> Plant a church for yeah. them. Yeah. And, it, and somehow or other, it was just what John needed to just yeah. go for it. And so he planted this church in Stratford, Ontario in 1981. And from 81 through to 1986, 87, um, they, they were leading that church and they learned all their lessons, if you like, mm. during that time. And John particularly had been very, very hungry for the Holy Spirit mm. since he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit in 1974 in Jerusalem at a David Duplessis conference with the Catholic, with, with, that was a sort of, you know, multi-denominational conference. And John went to Jerusalem as a young man, hungry for the Holy Spirit. And as he sat sitting among thousands of people at this David Duplessis conference, he sees on the platform that David Duplessis got even Catholic priests. And John's just judging in his heart. Like, what are those guys doing up there? Mm -hmm. And David Duplessis began to preach on the love of God. Mm -hmm. And as he began to preach on the love of God, the Holy Spirit just pierced John's heart with his attitude towards all these different denominations, especially mm -hmm. the Catholics. And John's, John realized that he knew nothing about the love of God. Mm -hmm. And as he began to repent about that, God just pierced his heart. He just began weeping, like to the point of uncontrollable weeping. Well, then the weeping gave way to the Holy Spirit crashing in on him. Mm. Wave after wave after wave after wave, going on all the way into the night. He couldn't sleep in his hotel room. God just visiting him with wave after wave of power to the point where he said, God, if you come with one more wave, I'm going to die, literally. And he, he, really, he really would have done. And uh, that, that moment put into John, a it marked him f with an insatiable desire mm -hmm. for the presence and power of God mm -hmm. and the very person of God. Mm -hmm. And it never left him. Mm -hmm. So fast forward now, during that time, during the 80s in their first church, they just were hungry for God. And God gave John a dream. And in this dream, he was, he went to a dairy and at this dairy in, and it was in Buffalo, New York. And at this dairy, he was given three pots of the most delicious cream. And he took these big pots home. And when he woke up, he felt the Holy Spirit say to him, I want you to go. Those three pots represent three very particular things that I want you to learn. And the first one you're going to get from Buffalo. And so he, <clears throat> he found out that there was, he phoned his, his friend, Tommy Reed, Pastor Tommy Reed, and he said, what's happening in your church right now? And he said, oh, we're having a conference. Well, what's it about? Hearing the voice of God uh, with uh, Dr. Mark Verkler. And so John went and learned, I mean, he's thinking, I'm a pastor. I know how to hear God's voice. But of course, in the conference, he really, for the first time in his life, discovered that God wants us to know him on an intimate level. Mm. And as he learned to hear God's voice, every time he would start doing these, putting these four keys to hearing God's voice, which, which, which are very simple out of uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, which is um, quietening down your heart, fixing your eyes on Jesus, tuning to the spontaneous flow of thoughts and writing them down. Mm -hmm. Not like automatic writing, but writing down mm -hmm. in the flow of what the Holy Spirit is, is sharing as you fix your eyes on Jesus. And so every time he would do that, he would hear, I love you, John. You're my beloved son. I'm so pleased with you. And he'd be like, Okay, stop, stop, stop. That, that's crazy. And <laughs> that, 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 that just, I must be making that up. Lord, I'm a pastor. Would you please tell me something useful mm. for my ministry? And the Lord, so he quieted his heart again, and the Lord would say, John, I love you. 
and he would start wow. speaking affectionately to him. Mm. And pretty soon John realized, well, wait a minute. I don't talk to myself like that. Mm. I'm, I talk to myself in the opposite way. Mm. And it, the devil nef- never talks to me like that. Mm. Maybe this really is the Lord. And as he began to learn to hear God's voice, he realized that God really, really loves us. Mm. And so he heard through a friend that there was a man by the name of Jack Frost, sorry, Jack Winter, excuse me, Jack Winter. It's funny because there's another man called Jack Frost who was also, uh, both of them were used mightily by God. Really? Yes, to bring the Father's love to the church. One was called Jack Winter and then the the younger one was Jack Frost. And Jack Winter prayed for Jack Frost. Oh my goodness. (laughs) And by the way, this whole revelation of the love of God in a movie would be called foreshadowing, (laughs) right? Because it's just amazing how this is all leading to. Well, so this, well, this is, this is the amazing thing. I just really want, want everybody to understand that this move of God was not a phenomena. Hmm. This is a genuine move of yeah. God, a move of the yeah. Spirit, yeah. centered in the Trinitary, the Trinity him, themselves, yeah. the, Trinity, the Trinitarian God yeah. of love. Yeah. And so John invited, John and Carol invited Jack to their church in Stratford, and he preached from John 14, starting with verse 1. And when he got to verse 6, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He paused and said, so everybody, where are we going? And everybody was like, well, I mean, we're going to heaven. We're going to, we're going to Jesus. We're going to... And he said, but what does it say? Hmm. And they looked again, and no one comes to the Father. And John's... Everybody's like, oh... You mean the Father's our eternal destination? Hmm. And then he had a second thought. Whoa, wait a minute. I'm not sure if I like that idea. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that. Because of our own wounding of our fathers. The notion of God as our father. Hmm. For, for anyone other than someone who's had a fantastic father, someone like Evan, for example, hmm. who's had a fantastic father, the idea might well be, you know, a, a repulsive, repulsive, yeah. because they've had really tough, really terrible fathers, yeah. and so. But anyway, that that's a whole other dynamic. But they discovered in that that you know the rest of the weekend, the father just crashed in on them in his liquid golden honey love, and they all got absolutely undone in the father's love. And in getting undone in the father's love, they realized, wow, God loves us just as we are. And therefore, if God loves us as we are, then it's possible that we can experience a move of God. That something out of my deepest inner being came flooding out of my stomach. And I began to laugh and weep because I just felt the love of the Father. And he was telling me that I was an encourager. I was just an encourager. And I need God to say, you're my boy, and I love you, man. And this is what I've made you to be. And I tell you what, that's what this revival really is a a lot about. It's the Father saying, I love you, and this is what I want you to do in life. And he's releasing destiny everywhere. But then, but pretty quickly, the Lord began to show them that John says it like this, God loves you as you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you as you are. And so as the love of God begins to move and and work in our hearts, now we become comfortable in his love to the effect that now we can actually allow him to begin to put his finger on the areas of our lives and our hearts that we have never allowed anybody to touch. Mm -hmm. Our wrong reactions. You know, it's not necessarily the sin of others that's ruined our lives. It's our wrong reactions to Mm -hmm. that sin that's Mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. held us in bondage. And so that led them to, you know, some of the uh, teaching of John and Paul of Samford and many, many others that talk about the transformation of the heart, the journey of the heart, which is a slow learner. Mm -hmm. The head's a quick learner, but the heart's a much slower learner. But as we get all of our wrong reactions, like, you know, the importance of forgiveness, because unforgiveness can block a move of God, like nothing else. And so the Holy Spirit wants to move everywhere. The fact that he isn't is on our end Hmm. very often. 
And so one of the big, big keys is unforgiveness. And of course, we're all like, oh, I've forgiven. But we're talking about that deep-rooted, you know, we want, we want grace for ourselves, mercy for ourselves, but we want justice for everybody else, right. you know. And so as, they begin, as God began to, th those three pots were, John realized in the dream was hearing the voice of God, intimacy with Jesus, the Father's love, and then the healing of life's hurts and the, and the transformation of our inner man through sanctification of the spirit, working with our will to bring us to a place, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, that we cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles us, mm -hmm. perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. This is so key because we think of Toronto mm -hmm. and what happened in 1994, which we'll get to in a moment. Yeah. When we don't realize the preparation, the years mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of preparation that went into yes, this. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. It wasn't on accident. Yeah. And so those were the, the, that was kind of like the preparation of the soil of John and Carol's hearts, but also the whole church. Mm -hmm. Because when they planted this church, when, when the Lord spoke to them and said, I want you to plant a church in Toronto, for five years, they led both churches. They, Sunday mm -hmm. mornings were in Stratford, Sunday evening was in uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. But by somewhere around the 91, something like that, the church in Toronto was well and truly established and was now, they began to focus on that church and they moved to Toronto. Uh, I forget the exact dates, but sometime around the late 80s, early 90s, they moved to Toronto and full-time now dedicated to that church and handed over the Stratford church to someone else. Around that time, the Lord said, I want you to set aside your mornings and I want you to go wherever I'm moving. Well, at that time, the Lord was really moving powerfully through Benny Hinn, for example, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Argentina, there was a great revival. There's been a great revival in Argentina. Yes. And so um, John and Carol got very, very uh, touched. And we say in our movement, blasted by the Holy Spirit at uh, a Benny Hinn moment, especially Carol. She was so dramatically touched by the Lord that she barely could, John had to carry her to the car. He had to put her to bed that night. And um, that was somewhere around about 92. By the time late 93, fall of 93 had come, they were so hungry for God. They did everything they could, begged, you know, begged and borrowed to raise the finances and flew to, Toronto, uh, to Argentina where they were, <clears throat> they went to a conference and they were immersed in this amazing revival that had been exploding in Argentina. And while they were there, um, Claudio Friedson made a call for any of the, the foreign pastors to come up onto the platform. And so John and Carol rushed up together with others and they were, they were lined up on the platform and uh, Claudio went down the line just saying, take it, take it, take it. And they were all, you know, powerfully touched. John says, Carol went down like a rag doll. And I kind of did a bit of a courtesy drop onto my knees, you know, just so I wasn't the only one standing. And um, as I went on my knees, I was kind of analyzing, thinking to myself now, was that me? Was that the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit? Like, what was that? Sudden, I think, did he push me? I don't know. You know, and suddenly Claudio whirled around, stopped praying for the next guy, whirled around and looked straight at John and said, do you want it? And John's first thought was, are you kidding me? What do you mean, do I want it? Why do you think I've spent all this money trying to get here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but suddenly he realized yeah. that God was giving him a massive key to actually receiving a move of God or even a personal touch of God. Mm. That, there, that there is an element in which God wants to know, do you want me? Mm. Yeah, are you hungry? Are you hungry? You know, and he thought about Smith Wigglesworth and how Wigglesworth said, you know, um, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move, then I move the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, he just realized it's about yielding. Mm. And he yielded and he said, yes, but it's not just about yielding, it's about taking it. And he said, yes, I do. 
yes, I do. And then Claudio said, well, then take it. And he just went flying off of his knees and crashed out on the floor. Mm. And he was just, mm. you know, again, had that encounter with the Holy Spirit that had happened in 1974. Well, they, that was in late December, 93. They got back and John heard, as soon as he got back in December, he heard within the vineyard circles, because they were a vineyard, John was an, a, an area vineyard leader of Northern Ontario, of Ontario and Northern United States, of that area around the lakes. And um, <clears throat> he heard that a pastor by the name of Randy Clark from Missouri, a vineyard pastor, had had a tremendous impartation, encounter and impartation at a Rodney Howard Brown meeting in Florida. And so John, being so hungry for God, he immediately contacted Randy, who he didn't know, and he may have met once and said, come to my church. And he's like, I've never been outside of Missouri. And he's like, I don't care, just come to my church. And he's like, and he was so reluctant. And John's like, you've got to come. And so Randy said yes, reluctantly said yes. Now Randy tells a story that he was so nervous that even getting onto the airplane required a cell phone call as he was about to get on, he almost turned back. But a man, a businessman from Texas called him a friend and said, the Lord's just had you heavily on my heart that you're really frightened of going to do something, but the Lord says, go. Some, mm -hmm. Those are my words, but something along those lines. Uh -huh. And it was enough to give Randy the courage. To and so Randy, Yes, mm -hmm. so Randy with a very small team got on the plane, got to Toronto, January the 20th, 1994, that first night, a Thursday night, Randy began to share with about 120 people showed up. In fact, there was even an equipping class going on in the room next door. That a pastor called Mary Audrey from the church was leading. So in other words, a what I mean class. is, yes, I mean, yeah. you know, just to give you an idea of that's how kind of like, Small we were just ordinary in that sense. Mm -hmm. Thursday night, another class going on as though that, yes. Randy goes, it tells the testimony of what had happened to him. And then it finishes it with, and if anybody wants this anointing, stand up and come out to the front. Mm. And John says it like this, that, <clears throat> you know, we all looked at each other. And we're like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Yeah, we, we could have some of that. Yeah, why not? Let's do that. So as they stood up, they were moving to stand up. Suddenly, the presence of God Almighty God just came en masse, kaboom, and hit these 120 people hmm. so hard that every one of them were just mushed to the floor. They were, some were spontaneously laughing uncontrollably. Some were spontaneously weeping uncontrollably. Almost all of them were shaking violently. It was out, it was beyond saying out of control. It was just like nothing they had ever seen before. And it went on and on and on and on. And Mary Audrey, who was in the equipping class, she could hear all this commotion. huge commotion mm -hmm. and cacophony and noise. She wondered what, what on earth's going on. She opened the door like this to see what was going on. And her first thought was, where is everybody? And then she realized they're all under the chairs. Mm. Everything was happening under the chairs. When I say everything, I mean everything. Nobody was standing. And the moment she saw that, she just, the power of God hit her and she face planted right there and then on her face. And then John always says, and the, and the first miracle of the revival happened, Mary Audrey, couldn't speak for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a loquacious. <laughs> she, was a, she was a preacher. Yeah. And she's lovely. But it was so epic, Alan, yeah. and so holy. John said to Randy, uh, you know, oh, and then the next night was the second night. 
same thing. It just exploded, but this time the, the room was packed because mm -hmm. people had heard about what had happened that night. Place was packed. By the third night, the lineup was right the way around the building. So when you say the place was packed, what are we talking? So it went from oh, only right. about three hundred people, to 300. though, because okay. four hundred, maybe mm. four hundred people. And it was pre-Wi-Fi internet days, and so people were getting on their phones and calling their friends, and all word of mouth. John, John was calling friends all over the world. Yeah, God's here. God's, God's here. doing something, and that was the beginning. And. Hmm. John said to Randy, and so the Sunday night came and now Randy's going home the next day. And John said, oh, no, you're not. And he got him to stay. And I think he stayed another couple days, something like that. And then he had to go back to his wife, Dee. And, you know, they're thinking, oh, no, Randy's gone. Has the Holy Spirit gone? Oh. You know, and that night. And so Randy had promised he'd come back in a couple of days. I think I could be getting my dates yeah, slightly he went, muddled. He went back for but he had a few to go days, back yeah. for a few days. And they were thinking, oh no, you know, has the Holy Spirit gone with Randy? But oh no, mm -hmm. God just came and and yeah. that started that that they did not stop meeting for twelve years. Every single night, on average, over a thousand people. For 12 years, Alan. Except Monday. Except after six months, they realized we've got to take Mondays off. The, the, the reason for the ability to keep going all that time was, was John, the genius put in John by the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit to, mm -hmm. excuse me, to um, number one, John very quickly mobilized prayer ministry training for anyone from any church. Hmm. As long as they went through the prayer ministry training and they each got a, a badge, a pink badge with their name on it to show that, mm -hmm. you know, and typed that they were that they were bona fide prayer ministry, mm -hmm. prayer ministry trained, trained and, and they got a blue dot if they that allowed you, you are. You're safe enough to be able to pray for either sex, I see. Yeah. either gender. And also, I think the genius of God was that John and Carol had already been training their local mm -hmm. church in prayer ministry. Wow. So it was just they opened it up to churches in the region to come and be part of the training. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they were able then to have a huge, huge prayer ministry teams that could do their shifts. Yeah. Are you with me? So yeah. that you yeah. would only come and be on one night, but then a whole different team would be on the second night and so on. But the quality was the same across the... It later became morning. the number one tourist... Mm -hmm. in, draw in, in that, Toronto. Yeah. 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 So in those first few days, what was the message? What was it? What was the the theme of mm -hmm. these meetings? Well, of course, other than the experience people were having of the. Yes. Well, of course, the one of the biggest themes was simply come Holy Spirit. And it became a, 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 a sort of famous. Yeah. Um, I think they had already learned it from John Wimber. Yeah. You know, come Holy Spirit, yeah. just simply say, come Holy Spirit, and he came. Yeah, and sometimes the, the, there wasn't even preaching. It was like, yeah. if you're hungry, come and receive. And then it was like, well, it was there again, an outpouring. Yeah. And so what was happening was that people were coming, not only hungry, they were burnt out, they needed refreshing, they needed healing in their marriages. You know, they were about to leave the ministry. And what God did was... There was so much refreshing that came when they encountered his presence yeah. that they people sometimes would be out on the floor in the spirit for hours, uh, yeah. incapacitated, shaking, crying, laughing, moving around. It, it was like it was just the hand of God. And, and it wasn't just that they were on the ground or they had the experience. They got up and left. And started a thousand churches yes. around yes. the world. That exactly. was the unusual fruit of <clears throat> exactly. it that no one ever talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who were their detractors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, whether we talk about Bill Johnson, Bill and Benny Johnson, who who came from Bethel, you know, mm -hmm. from Bethel, and the Holy Spirit. You know, Bill says he got there, and this was everything he'd ever wanted, and mm -hmm. he he just said, "God, with all my heart, mm -hmm. I would like that." Mm -hmm. And you know, he went back home and the very first Sunday he said, come Holy Spirit, welcome the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit just dropped on mm -hmm. his church, which was two and a half thousand mm -hmm. people. 
And he, you know, he, he talks about it famously that in, on that very Sunday, I think half of his congregation got up and walked out and left the church. Wow. But he said, it wouldn't matter who left. Mm. The Holy Spirit is the best person we could ever possibly have. To have him is to have everything. Yeah. And he, he, Bill wouldn't have minded who left as long as the Holy Spirit never left. So 12 years of the And Holy now they're Spirit. a church of over 10,000, you know. And, and their influence and impact goes All well, over well the world. beyond, right. yeah, well yeah. beyond that. It will yeah. for generations to come. Yes, exactly. Other voices like Heidi Baker and mm-hmm. others. Heidi's another example. R.T. Mm-hmm. Kendall. Yes. R.T. Kendall. Uh, yeah. I, heard, I heard a testimony of R.T. Kendall's wife yeah. who was sick and depressed and he wanted to possibly go after the revival in Toronto, but she was supernaturally healed Wow! Mm-hmm. as a result of it. And what a tremendous theological, mm-hmm. doctrinal voice to have saying, how could I be against it? Yes. How mm-hmm. could I insult yeah. God when he has delivered my yeah. wife in such a, yeah. such a lasting way? And it mm-hmm. lasted, you know, yeah. she, was, she was really delivered and set free. Tremendous. So 12 years, six days a week. Yeah. A thousand plus people. Mm-hmm. What are some yeah. of the greatest miracles? Mm-hmm. And you're there. Yeah. Were you there when it started or what year did you come to be a part no, of? We came in 2000, so we were six years late. Okay. But having said that, we had been very dramatically impacted early on in 94. And 95, yeah. Uh, and throughout, yeah, all the way from 94, late 94 in England. Because the Holy Spirit moved so powerfully, everybody just wanted the presence of God. People. People our age, left, right, and center, were all, we were all young in our 20s, and everyone was talking at once about it. Have you heard about Toronto? God's moving in Toronto. Mm. And everybody wanted God. And so, you know, three to five million people came during those 12 years, but none of them came for a speaker. Well, maybe they did, but that's an exaggeration. In the early but days. Yeah. It, it wasn't spe- you know, around a speaker. personality driven. You didn't even know who. It, no, yeah. you didn't know who was going to be the speaker. You just knew if I go, I'm going to meet God. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I don't even know how to answer what are the greatest miracles because they're, the number of miracles, Alan, it's no exaggeration to say an untold number yeah. of supernatural miracles. I mean, you know, blind people getting healed, people coming out of wheelchairs, marriages, restored. marriages getting restored, yeah. financial, extraordinary financial miracles. I, um, I think as well, I mean, just so many ministries illness. burst in that era. Hmm. You know, we often meet people now and they say, oh yeah, I came to Toronto, I came and did whatever. I came and yeah. showed up for the conference, hungry for God. And then there are people like um, Nikki Gumbel that started the Alpha course that has been an incredible tool for reaching the lost in the nations. And many ministries born be, because of And his an visit to the Toronto, uh, to Toronto and the revival in, in Toronto and also the spillover back to their church in Holy Trinity Brompton, um, that, that, that's what birthed in his heart Alpha. And I think for many people, they go through life, we're always searching for the next thing. And when we get there, we find it doesn't satisfy. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I'm the one person who can satisfy that kind of spiritual hunger that is in every human heart. So that other things, however good they may be, relationships, work, hobbies, whatever, sport, somehow they always leave us with this feeling that something's missing. Wow. Yeah. Think even, about that. Even here in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, there's a woman on the stage who was singing who, when she was a teenager, mm. came and was there and blessed. Uh, really? And would not yeah. be wow. here probably today if it weren't for what yeah. she received. Yeah. yeah. In Toronto. There 50,000 documented salvations. 50,000 documented yeah. salvations came out of that movement. And just in the building. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. that first building... Uh, that was a second, uh, that was a very early miracle for John and Carol was that the building of only 400 was far too small for the mm-hmm. crowds. And so the Lord gave them the opportunity to buy a building that's 75,000 square feet and will seat up to, yeah. um, well, now about 4,000. But back then yeah. uh, they had it, the, the auditorium was big enough to have 6,000 people. And um, 
And it was packed. And John and Carol birthed a school of ministry where young people came from all over the nations of the world. So even those young people that were set on fire, they've gone all over the nations yeah. and yep. started ministries, businesses, and have an influences yes, exactly. in churches. I mean, it's you just can't record. The fruit is incalculable. Fruit. John and Carol's willingness to allow the Holy Spirit to move yes. without shutting it down yes. is yes. kind of a key hallmark. And yes. even when I look back at some of the stories that I now know that I didn't know until recently, until, yep. until meeting you, I wonder, would I, as a pastor, have allowed mm. that to happen? And so, yep. so now we get to the reason why so many people mm. know nothing about Toronto, because all they ever heard were some strange, animal noises. marginal, yeah, animal yeah. noises. Yeah. This isn't this isn't uh, um, uh, the vineyard. This is the barnyard yes. type thing. So I want to go mm -hmm. into that now. Yeah. Let's good. talk about these manifestations. That that's all people know. And as a result, they don't know anything about twelve years, six days a week. The glory yeah. of God fell, yeah. and fifty thousand people were saved in the facility, and ministries were born. Didn't know anything about that. I just thought people were barking like dogs. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. so, Which you know is typical of the of the enemy to just zoom in on that. And the reality was the people barking like dogs or roaring like lions or clucking like chickens or whatever, all of those, like roosters, all of those people weren't part of the ministry. They were part of the visitors coming. They were marginal outside experiences right. that came in. Now, yeah. I, I want to be careful, though, okay, to make sure that our listeners understand that it, it, I'm not saying that to say that the animal noises were wrong. Because here's the deal. The Holy Spirit loves humility so much, mm -hmm. and he loves prophetic symbolism. And there are many instances in scripture where he asks people to do things that don't make any mistake, that don't make any sense to the natural mind. Yeah. Because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, offends the mind of man. And now, I don't think it's something that we would encourage that everybody does animal noises by any stretch of the imagination. But the Lord had said to John, okay, actually, John had said to the Lord, because the Holy Spirit came powerfully in Stratford in the 80s for a short season, and John started doing nightly meetings, and then the Spirit lifted, and so they finished the meetings. And the, John was heartbroken. And he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, why did you lift? And the, he felt the Lord showing him that because he had been, he had been saying, well, they're fine, but no, shut that down. Let that happen, but not that over there, and so on. And he said to the Lord, Lord, I promise you, I'm so sorry that I did that. And I'm so sorry if I offended you. Please, God, if you just would give me one more chance, I promise I'll never touch it. Hmm. And, it, and it's, it's making me emotional thinking about mm. that because that's, that's the heart of our pastor. Mm. And I believe that's the kind of heart that God's looking for. Mm. And it's so hard for him to find that on earth because we all want to control it. And largely we want to control it for our own reputations mm. and our own egos. And so John and Carol, when the Holy Spirit fell in 94, they knew immediately, okay, and so the Lord, John asked the Lord, well, Lord, how do I pastor this? And the Lord said to him, you'll know by their fruit. So don't shut it down in the moment. You know, he gave them words to, for people, you know, train the prayer ministry team people to say more, Lord, and keep coming, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we bless what you're doing right here. And, you know, is it the Lord? This person's going nuts. Is it the Lord? Is it the person? their own personality trying to show off? Or is it the devil? What is it? We, you know, they're having deliverance. Well, we may, may, it's probably all three, maybe even, you know. The Holy Spirit coming in, the person's personality of, in their search for significance, making something of that. And then the enemy being displaced and, you know, fleeing in the moment and coming out of the person. So, mm. you know, prayer ministry team were taught to say, Holy Spirit, come in and Devils get out and, you know, light dispels darkness. And so more, Lord, and everything that's evil, please leave right now. And whatever, you know, those kinds of prayers are coming. So it's important to note and, and dispel the myth that this, 
the the animal noises or sounds or whatever were not common. No, they were not. They common. were not a part of the actual local ministry. Not a part of any Correct. belief. Not encouraged no. in any way, not shape, or form. No. But. John said, Lord, I, I don't want to get in the way Correct. of what you're doing. Yes. How can we test, yeah. verify, yes. there you and go. trust you in these yeah. moments yeah. so that we don't quench what the Spirit is doing? And I'll give you an example mm-hmm. of a particular, the first animal noise. Okay. John tells it like this. He was somewhere in the world like Germany. I forget exactly which country it was, but you can imagine the Holy Spirit landing like that, people, invitations came from all over the world for yeah. them to go. And everywhere they would go, it would blow up. Mm. And they were invited to some of the largest ministries in the world, and God blew the place up. You know, Hillsong, I mean, many of these places. Well, on this one occasion, John would always phone back, and uh, you know, his leader that he'd left in charge uh, would give a report to him, you know. So he, on this one particular day, so how's it going back there? And, he's, and this lady said, that answered the phone that particular day, she said, well, well, everything's going great, but, to, but last night we had a lion roaring. And he's like, <laughs> what? You had a what? We had a lion roaring. And he said, well, I hope you shut that down. And she said, no, you've taught us never to do that. <laughs> And so he's like, oh, goodness gracious. All right, listen, I'll know what to do when I get home. Mm-hmm. Leave it to me. Well, most people would come on a, Saturday, a Sunday night, right, honey, and go all the way to the following Saturday night. You know, they would spend a week with us. And so John got back. You know, let's say it happened on a Monday, uh, on, a, on the Sunday night. And, you know, they'd have Monday off and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, John got back in time for the person to still be there. Mm-hmm. And John heard them roaring. So John gets up on the platform and John said, well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be home. And uh, I understand that while I've been away, we've had a lion roaring. In fact, I heard him tonight. And John (laughs) has this beautiful sense of humor. You know, he's, he's really wonderfully, hilariously funny. And yet at the same time, extraordinary authority in the spirit. So anyway, he says, why don't you come up? And that's just like John as well, to bring the... Call up the distraction. Right yes, in center. Yeah. And let, let's use this as an object lesson for A teaching for moment. Yeah, a teaching, a teaching moment. moment. And so he brings this person up, and it's a... Then the person is a Chinese-born Canadian from Vancouver. And he's... So as he comes up, you know, he's walking across the stage, large stage, and he starts roaring, you know, like this and oh everybody's like whoa what in the world and John's like wow it's real you know and he comes right up and he's just roaring away of course John's like Mm. you know um making the the best of the moment and when so when he sort of calmed down a little he said so what is tell us what God's doing here with you and the man said he's shaking under the power of the spirit he says, the Lord show me, the Lord spoke to me and said, for 6,000 years, my Chinese bride has been held in darkness by the dragon. But now the tr- lion of the tribe of Judah is triumphing over the dragon that's held my Chinese bride. Roar! Hmm. And he said, I had to roar. So I roared. Gideon, why don't you come up, my dear brother? Come this way. I'll help you up this step. This way, this way. I want want you to lead us in a prayer here that God will pour out his Holy Spirit on China like the world has never known. There's something here happening. This precious Chinese pastor from Vancouver We just have grown to love him. But let's pray. Gideon, please lead us. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God of China. Father, once again I ask that you will forgive us Chinese. 
for acknowledging the thief, the usurper as our God, the dragon. Father, we are publicly denounced. The dragon is the God. Father, we have replaced him. And Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is the sacrifice of China. And tonight I ask that you begin, O oh God, let the lion of the tribe of Judah rise and roar, roar, roar. Let my people go, let my people go, dragon. Let the one point two million Chinese go. Wash up, Mataya. God, you promise to reserve the best wine for the last hour. Yes, the Holy Spirit for the last hour. I ask that you will begin to pour the best wine upon especially the Chinese at this hour, Lord, so that we can pick up the baton and let the gospel run back to Jerusalem. In Jesus' name. Oh, we bless you, Gideon, in the name of Jesus. Yes. We bless you, Gideon, in the name of Jesus. Now, here's the amazing thing. That man is called Gideon Chua. That, 20 years later, at our 20th anniversary of the Holy Spirit falling, was massive conference, thousands of people. John knew, had heard that Gideon was, was among the, the, the delegates in the conference. So he invited, he said, where's Gideon Chua? Come on up. Mm -hmm. And he said, Gideon, 20 years ago, you were roaring like a lion, and we paid quite a price for that. Hmm. But tell us, tell us what's happened. He said, in the last 20 years, John, the church in China has exploded hmm. to the point of now more than 30,000 Chinese people a day give their lives to Jesus. Wow. Let the lion roar. Yeah. Yes. Let the lion roar. And so, you know, it was just, a, I'm crying now because it was just yeah, an amazing moment. It really was. And the, the testimonies, John and Carol really encouraged testimonies. And, it, you know, people were being touched in their droves. People would come up. They would talk about how their marriages got healed, how their bodies got healed. And it was just like there was a, an explosion of, of even more stuff happening because the testimony was declared. Yes. Yeah. And um, I, think, I think that's just been a powerful thing in just kind of stewarding what God's doing, that this revival is for, for anyone and everyone that is ready for this. And it, I mean, it was just so much, there was so much joy and life as you saw desperate, dried up people People that were going to give up in ministry, people that were going to give up in their marriages and whatever, just being filled again with the joy of heaven. It lasting, is. Yeah, absolutely. lasting yeah. fruit. Oh, lasting fruit. And, th and this revival's not over. No. no. It's, it's, it's not something that we talk about in, past, no. in the past. It's David still Ruth, going. It's yeah. just exploding yeah. all over the world. Full yeah. disclosure, too, as a student of revival history, an amateur revival historian, I run across strange manifestations, and as a personal testimony, I can say, when I do, I skip over it really fast and I go to the next thing that's mm -hmm. more acceptable, palatable, palatable mainstream, yeah. and easily forgotten, thrown yeah. into the waste bin of, of yeah. the memory, and yeah. 
when we're studying revival history, even in the first great awakening, the second great awakening, there are people barking like dogs, yeah. wow. saying that they're chasing the devil away. I mean, there's, yeah. they were they would be they would say they're barking devils up trees. Yeah. Wow, yeah. and people would say they're crazy, like a coon dog, like a <laughs> there's your North Carolina, like a coon dog, your North Carolina accent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but at the time people would say that was crazy. Yeah. But now that we look back on it, without the knowledge of that happening, we call that the great awakening. And the Lord said to me. Will you howl for me? I said, don't ask me to do that, Lord. He said, if I ask you, will you do it? He said, if I can't ask you to do something in your own house, how are you going to do it out there? So... The Toronto blessing, as it's been mm -hmm. deemed, has yep. been tarnished yep. with people manipulating these testimonies so that people yep. don't know that after he roared like a lion, 30,000 a day mm -hmm. are being yep. swept into the kingdom. Yep. But even with that, some of us would say, even people watching this, okay, all right, roar like a lion, that's fine. Yep. Barking like a dog, clucking yep. like a chicken. Yep. Uh, isn't this the reason why Vineyard had to... Yeah, well, so it absolutely, um, uh, sorry, I cut you off before the end of your sentence, no. before the vineyard had to ask us to leave the vineyard. Yes. So, that, you know, there's a story in, in all of that as well. In, um, during the 90s, uh, or the 80s and the 90s, you know, John Wimber was the founder of our movement that we were birthed in, the vineyard. And Anaheim, in California, the Anaheim Vineyard Church was the sort of epicenter of that move, of the move of God, of the Vineyard Church, even, you know. And so uh, every year, John and Carol Wimber would hold a big conference in the Anaheim uh, Center. And Paul Kane, sometime in 92 or 93, prophesied, John and Carol Arnott were at the conference, and Paul came prophesied an extraordinary move of God is about to hit the vineyard and hit the world through John and Carol. And it's not the John and Carol that you think. Mm. Well, at that time, everybody only knew John and Carol Wimber. Nobody really uh, at large knew that there's another John and Carol, John and Carol Arnott, that are also in the vineyard. Mm. Well, of course... The Holy Spirit lands in Toronto not long, shortly afterwards, and suddenly everyone's flocking to Toronto. Not Anaheim. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Toronto. And John and Carol were invited by John and Carol Wimber to be guest speakers in 94, 95, I forget which, how many, but at some sometime in that era of, era of time. And they were the guest speakers at the big Anaheim conference because of what had happened in Toronto. Well, the Holy Spirit just exploded in the Anaheim conference when John and Carol were, mm. it was their turn to minister. It was absolute pandemonium, ca chaos yeah. in the Holy Ghost. Mm. Mm. And you can imagine, okay, you've got the whole world going to Toronto. Then the people that are the hosts come to Anaheim and it blows up bigger than ever. Mm -hmm. Then the Holy Spirit lands and endorses it and it goes bigger than ever. You've got to be very secure. Mm. As a leader. As a leader. Yeah. Right? Now, there's a lot of dignitaries on the platform including a lady by the name of Ann Watson. And Ann Watson was the widow of the late David Watson, who was one of John Wimber's best friends and was the um, arch, uh, the- um, was part of the Anglican church. Part, one of the senior, I think like an archbishop or not, maybe not an archbishop, but a, but a, a bishop mm -hmm. or a big pastor anyway, of a famous church in York, England. England. I think it's York Minster. Is it? York, no, St. No, Michael's the Belfry. St. Michael's the Belfry Church. And he was famous in the UK for having had renewal and a move of God. 
And John Wimber was a big part of that move of guard. The but then in the 70s and early 80s, and then sadly, David Watson was diagnosed with cancer and died from cancer. Mm -hmm. And kind of like, you know, it, it, it sort of was sh a shock yeah. to the vineyard because of his friendship with John Wimber and everyone. And so now Anne Watson, grieving. you know, grieving, grieving not, long, not that long after he had died, and she's there, and she got absolutely hit by the Holy Ghost and turned into a holy roller on the floor. And she's just going ballistic. And, you know, and the micro, a microphone in all the chaos, a microphone <laughs> was near her. <laughs> was on the where she had around. rolled around and rolled near her mouth. And she's yelling out at the top of her voice even louder now because it's through the microphone system. This is not the vineyard, this is the barnyard. Now she's meaning it as a playful joke because she's getting so hit by the yeah. joy of the Lord. And God is restoring her. Uh -huh. God's restoring her. Yeah, her grief the and grief. Grave clothes exactly. off, coming out of her mourning, all the joy of the Lord's hitting her. But you can imagine mm. yeah. someone somewhere is going, you know, oh. the tabloids in the UK. I'm sure every tabloid newspaper picks that up. Yeah, exactly. Every detractor. Yeah, the tabloids yeah. in the UK had already famously coined the term, the Toronto blessing. That wasn't what we didn't call it, the Toronto blessing. The, the, John Arnott never called it the Toronto blessing. He called it the Father's blessing. But the UK, like Sun, Mirror, Daily Telegraph, Times, all the big name newspapers, it was spread all over the front pages in January 94, or, or maybe February, March, whenever, it, you later. know, later, yeah. as it gathered momentum. And it gathered so much momentum in 94 that, that it was all over the British tabloid. They called it the Toronto Blessing. The planes were being chartered from the UK. Yeah. And huh. so you can imagine someone thinking, oh gosh, and seeing the vineyard becomes the barnyard, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Now, this is just us. Just the negative press Duncan and Kate talking moment. now. And mm -hmm. John and Carol, we've often talked about it. Yeah. But you can imagine mm. someone somewhere was like, that's no way. Now, sadly, in, you know, by the time 95, 96 came, John Wimber himself was battling cancer. And even though he was battling cancer, he flew up to Toronto and they had a big meeting in the boardroom, John and Carol and John Wimber and um, some of his people from his leaders from, from Anaheim. And basically they laid out an ultimatum to John Arnott and Carol and said, you have two choices. You either, you either shut down the, this, these revival nights mm. and end the revival nights and you can carry on being a Toronto Airport Vineyard Christian Fellowship, or you carry on with these nights, insisting that you're going to carry on with these nights, but you leave the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And so John and Carol, they had a two hour discussion back with, you know, everybody talking and trying to negotiate and get it, you know, get, get to a place of where of understanding and talking about why, why would you give us that ultimatum? And, you know, we love the vineyard, we're vineyard, we're, this, you're our, we're, this is our move, we don't want to be our own independent, you know, whatever, and, mm. you know. And then suddenly John just realized they didn't come here to negotiate, they came here to end, yeah. to, to make sure that we did not continue with these nightly meetings. Mm. For whatever reason, we don't understand, but, we cannot walk away from the greatest move of God that we've ever seen in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And he had already covenanted with God that mm -hmm. he would never Correct. do that again. Yeah, yeah, Correct. Yeah. So he feared the and Lord in that he moment. He feared the Lord yeah. in that moment. And so he said, okay, well, in that case, it sounds like we're no longer a vineyard church. Mm. And so that... But the revival sad. continued. The revival continued. Mm -hmm. And I might add that I, I met... Uh, Paul Kane, who knew John Wimber personally and visited uh, John Wimber just before he died. And he told me, um, as and other men of God, mighty men of God, who also were, you know, John Paul Jackson and uh, Mike Bickle and others, who were also friends with John Wimber, and all said the same thing that on his deathbed, 
his, he verbalized that his biggest regret, one of his biggest regrets was that ultimate, giving that ultimatum to John and Carol and forcing mm. Toronto out of the vineyard. Mm. Wow. He himself regretted that. So in no way were these manifestations that kind of spurred this characteristic of the revival. It was an aberration, a, a, a small percentage of what took place during mm. those 12 years. In terms of the the animal noises themselves, but even then, there was still unusual know, stuff going on. Oh, and, plenty of. But you know, one example on. was Heidi Baker. Yeah. You know, okay. Heidi Baker came yeah. and was out in the spirit for days. Mm -hmm. yes. Incapacitated. Seven days incapacitated. Had to have people taking her to the meeting, home to the hotel. Getting a her ready husband, for, for those who don't know, this is a missionary who was burnt out totally. with two PhDs. Yeah, shows up at Toronto and gets yes. What was the phrase that you used by the Holy Spirit? Completely blasted and blasted. Yes. Right, I try to adopt right. that yes. phrase. Blasted by the Holy Spirit and humbled by the Holy Spirit as well, and then leaves there to establish oh, totally. how many churches? Thousands, ten thousands, thousands. ten thousand churches and, around the world. Oh, I mean, her story goes on many times, and she she kept coming back because for her it was a place of refreshing. Hmm. It was like a well and an uh, activity center for the Holy Spirit. Correct. Oh, totally. Yes. And she said her to us personally that some of her eight, eight, eight out of, of ten. ten of her most. Um, predominant encounters took place when there. she came to Toronto yeah. to receive. And one day, the Lord told her to run to the front and stand on her head at the altar while Randy Clark was preaching. A conference of 3,000. And she's like, oh, no, Lord. And she, she's the type of person that would never no. want to draw attention to herself. Run to the front and Run stand, to the front. stand on your head. Stand on your head. She's even capable of standing well, on your head. Well, exactly. <laughs> and she, of course, she's saying, Lord, you know, the, the security are going to, because we had security. They're yeah. going to take me the out. The security are going to take me out, whatever. But the Lord kept saying, go do it, go do it. So she plucked up the courage, walked down or ran down to the front while Randy's preaching in front of 3,000 people, let's say. I'm just guessing, but that, that's, that was a typical conference. And she stood on her head, did a headstand for 20 minutes. Like, who can do that in the natural? Right there in front of everybody. And, Randy's and of course, John and Carol just let her do it because like, the God, Lord had said, don't. God's doing something. Yeah. Control with that, anything. That little blonde woman. <laughs> and they didn't. Yeah. And, and Randy starts prophesying and saying, I'm going to turn your world upside down. Hmm. And, and, I'm, and yep. we knew she was a missionary from Mozambique. God's going to give you the nation of Mozambique. Do you want it? Do you want it, Heidi? He's going to turn your world upside down. And she's like, yes, yes. <laughs> and she goes back, a flood, the, the flood, a gigantic like, flood. The whole nation's flooded and they have all these Opportunities you know, to help opportunities, with food doors and, open and up. doors Correct. open to and villages. And within a very, very short space of time, thousands of churches were started and to this day are going, and the nation has been in revival. So it's important to note that though there was great liberality, it wasn't without policing. Mm -hmm. Correct. So I, I remember you telling me the story of someone who was dancing a certain way. Right, yes. And John's way of dealing with that. Maybe that's a good example to mm -hmm. share Great how, example. Yeah. how yeah. it was policed. And there was accountability and structure and yeah. authority. Yeah. So um, I remember one particular Sunday. Uh, for a number of Sundays, there'd been this lady who was among the crowd, but insisted on being in a certain location, or at least it looked like she insisted within herself because she would always be in the same spot. And she just appeared. At the altar. You know, from oh, nowhere. Yeah. From She's from Toronto, but appeared out of nowhere. And she would start doing this weird, I mean, it, it, she was dancing, but there was a weirdness to it. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say why, but it, there just was. In the discernment and, area, you just. Yeah, and, uh, and she would insist on being right up at the front. And, you know, whether there was many or few, she'd be there. And for several weeks, you know, and this one particular Sunday, John said to me, Duncan, come here. Now, I was the executive director for eight years. And that means that I was overseeing the ministry, 130 staff plus, you know, 
um, tender raters, all the rest of it. So I was John's number two, if, if you like. So John goes, come here, darling. So I come over to him Sunday morning during the worship. He says, see that lady over there? I want you to go over there and ask her to dance under the flags. Now, the flags are over to the side. Mm -hmm. And I said, why, John? She, he said, well, she's rather a distraction. Now, that's the only thing that, that you know, John doesn't, John doesn't want anybody to be distracted from looking to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, so I go over to this lady and I say, excuse me. Now, she was from a Korean background uh, with, you know, and a, anyway, I said, um, excuse me, ma'am, um, but would you mind, I'd like you to go and dance under the flags, please. No, God told me, dance here. So I said, oh, okay. And I'm thinking to myself, well, please don't make this difficult for me, lady. So I go back to my pastor and I say, John, she said, no. He said, well, go back and tell her, dance under the flags or we'll ask you to leave the premises. I'm like, wow, that sounds very harsh. Are you serious? He's like, I'm absolutely serious. So I go back to her, I tell her. She say, no, I'm not moving. God told me here. So I go back, I tell John. I'm thinking this is just getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. John goes, Dunk, go back one more time. Tell her if she doesn't go under the flags, we're going to call the cops and have her removed. Now, in the UK, trespassing is not a criminal offence. You can't call the cops and, on trespassers per se. It's common law offence. In Canada, like here in America, mm -hmm. if you want somebody off your premises because they're trespassing, the police will remove you. So I'm, I'm like, goodness gracious. Now, I, we used to be a police officer in the UK when I was fresh out of university for three years. And I'm thinking to myself, John, no police officer on this planet is going to want to remove somebody for dancing <laughs> wrongly in church. <laughs> so I say to John, John, I can't possibly do that. You can't be serious. He looked at me, and it's not very often he's like this, but with literally flashing eyes, he said, Duncan, I've never been so serious in my life. Go tell that lady right now. I'm like, okay. So I go over to this lady. I say, excuse me, ma'am, but... I'm not just asking you to go to the flags now to dance. I'm telling you that if you don't, we're going to call the cops. So she says, then call the cops. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just a nightmare. Mm. So I go to our head of security and I say, Frank, John wants us to call the cops to remove that lady. He goes, no way. I said, yes, he's not serious. I said, he's never been so serious in his life. So Frank goes to the back, calls the cops. The cops arrive. I go to the back to meet them with Frank. The cops arrive, two of them. <laughs> I want you to imagine there's well over a thousand people, okay, it's Sunday morning service, and there's a lot of crazy <laughs> things yes, going on yeah. in the room, right? You know, people going, wow, 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 you know, <laughs> shaking and whatever. And the worship's now stopped, and the MC for the morning's up on the platform. Mary Audrey, actually, the lady who face planted, she happened to be MCing that Sunday. And she's just transitioning the meeting, and people are making their way back to their seats and so on. And the cops say, I understand that there's someone in the here that it, uh, is, you know, behaving unusually, and you'd like them removed, and they refuse to do what you're asking. Uh, could you point, you know, and we're, we're talking and point her out. And I, I point to this, you know, innocent lady who's That's making her way back to her seat. <laughs> no longer dancing. And she's just looks not, like a normal. She's yeah. just looking normal. normal. Meanwhile, there's chaos everywhere. And I go, that one right there. And he goes, the police officer's like, are you sure it's not, it's only that lady? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know, please. Yes, I get what you're saying. Yes, it's that lady. So I'm thinking, oh no, in front of a thousand people to have two police officers come in and take this lady out is just the worst PR you can imagine. Well, Mary Audrey, not knowing any of this goes on, she says, okay, everybody, break into twos and threes, 
We're praying for our missionaries all over the world in the persecuted church. So everybody starts praying. They've all got their eyes closed. I'm like, right, this is the moment. Let's mm -hmm. go right now. Mm -hmm. All that happened as if it was choreographed by heaven. Mm -hmm. We went in. The police officer said to the lady, uh, please come with us. You're no longer welcome in this premises. And she just was like a meek lamb. Thankfully, she didn't get mad or anything. She didn't say a word. They just walked her off the premises and we never saw her again. A perfect example of how it was never a free-for-all. Mm, Correct. It was right. just an open an opening for the Holy Spirit to yes. move yes. and figuring out how do I discern mm -hmm. what's fruitful and yep. making sure nothing is a distraction. Yes. Correct. Yes. And actually during that period of time that she was doing that strange thing, the, the attendance at our church were sort of going down. And after she was that moment, the attendance started getting mm. back up. Mm. Just an interesting thing, and you know, it's important not to allow open doors for the enemy to keep mm. going. And I guess John yeah. had been wanting to watch the fruit for a few weeks, and just really came to the point where he's saying the fruit of what I'm seeing is somebody who's drawing attention to themselves. Mm. If it's not a distraction, wait for the fruit. Right. Mm to see if it's beneficial, mm. if it's glorifying Christ. Yeah. Exactly. And often John would stop people in the middle of their encounter. You know, he would be preaching and the people would be on the floor receiving. And he would say to Carol, Carol, go and ask them what's happening. And it, they would sort of come to and they'd say, well, I'm running because the Holy Spirit was saying it's time to start running with me and not to be held back from the past. Mm. And, you know, people were riding yeah. bicycles in the air. And he was actually trying to understand what is God doing in this moment A in lot of life? prophetic symbolism. A lot Correct. of prophetic symbolism. And the, and the more there's prophetic symbolism, the more there's prophetic symbolism, right? Because yes. the permission Correct. has been granted yes. Correct. for the Lord to move yes. in that way. And yes. so now all of a sudden... It just multiplies. Yes. yes. Yeah. And it the, the fruit mm. of that... Mm moment mm. increases the more the prophetic symbolism is yeah. celebrated. Yeah. So for example, I'll give you a biblical yeah. example. I believe it was King Jehoahaz in 2 Kings uh, where it says that Elisha was sick with the sickness in which he died. And the uh, Arameans came up against Israel and Elisha called the king and said, open the window, take bow and arrow. And the king took the bow and arrow and Elisha placed his hands on the king's hands and the bow. And he told him, draw back, shoot the arrow. And he shot the arrow through the open window. And he said, the victory belongs to the Lord and you're gonna have a victory. And then he said, take the arrow, strike the arrow on the ground, Elisha said to the king. So the king, you can imagine he's thinking, he's already feeling uncomfortable with his hand, you know, the elderly man's hands on his hands, and he's like, oh, for goodness sakes, what's this going to do, you know? And he strikes the ground. You know, the Bible doesn't say how he struck it. It just said he struck it three times only. But you can imagine it was like, yeah, right. Like, Half what's this going to do? Half-hearted, you know, bum, bum, bum. And Elisha was angry with him and rebuked him and said, you should have struck it five or six times. Mm and then your victory would have been complete. But as it is, you're only gonna have a small victory, a partial victory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, John's taught us, you know, that, that scriptures like that help us to understand that, that God, God's not looking to endorse our reputations. Hmm. He's not saying, I'm going to move on your terms. Hmm. He's saying, I'm going to move on my terms. Yeah. And are you willing to partner with me, even if it doesn't make any sense to your natural mind? Yeah. Are you going to do what I'm asking you to do? Faith like because a child. I'm, yes, because I'm trying to teach you that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Hmm. It's not by your abilities. It's by my abilities. You know, as difficult as it is, would I as a pastor allow that to happen? It's a hard question, but what's mm. even harder is when you look yourself in the mirror at 
what you're actually saying. Would I allow that mm. to happen? As if, as if you're I'm, the one. I'm the arbiter of what's yeah. good and yeah. what's yeah. bad and what's yeah. right and what's wrong. Yeah. And it's a hard lesson. Yep. And as we move forward, and in closing in just a moment, because I want you to pray for us that we'll be open and that we'll be mm -hmm. willing to receive from the Holy Spirit. But you mentioned that it wasn't called the Toronto blessing by them. It was called the Father's, the blessing. Father's blessing. What was the central message? Yeah. Why yeah. the Father's blessing? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It was really about the outpouring of love. Yeah. We, you see, we were in the UK in 94 till 2000 when we got there. And we just kept hearing about the joy of the Lord being released, the, the power of God, people getting healed. We're like, well, you know, revival's happening. But actually, until we went for our first, went for the visit in, in uh, May 2000, we realized, wow, this is about the love of God being poured out. Mm. And when the love of God falls, then the power of God is released. Yeah. You know, it's like that vineyard song, more love, more power. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like the they're, they're two hands, you know, you can't have one without the other. Yeah. And we realized it was about the Father pouring out a baptism of love on his church because we were behaving like orphans. Yeah. Everybody's mm -hmm. striving for ministry and recognition. Striving for significance. And you know, it's no different now. You no. know, ministry no. feels like that. You're yeah. competing, everyone's trying to get an edge. You know, what's my core message that's gonna set me apart? Mm -hmm. And I think really when we realized it was about yielding to the love of God mm -hmm. and allowing mm -hmm. him and his love to transform our hearts and set us in a place where we knew that our identity was a son and a daughter yeah. and not an orphan or a yeah. slave working for his approval mm, and yeah. just being able to receive and rest in that love i think that's what the soaking prayer was all about that people would cultivate that intimacy with jesus through the father mm. and experience the love and the healing that comes the healing to our hearts yes. through hearing the voice of god saying you're my precious daughter. I'm so proud of you, yeah. who you are. You don't have to try and please me. You're already pleasing to me. Yeah. I think that was the message that really yeah. captivated us. She said, the Lord told me the, that you've been going through a desert time and he's allowed you to go through this time, but he's about to restore you. And now you'll have mercy because before you never had mercy when people was in that desert, when they were in the valley, but now you will after he's restored you. He said, I looked down, I saw a magazine, I picked it up, looked at it, and I realized, uh, as a Charisma magazine, is this guy going to be having a, a, a seminar? So he went to it. When he got there, he called me and said, Randy, you'll not believe what I saw. I saw people laughing everywhere. I mean, hundreds of them, they were laughing. and I don't know why they were laughing, they were just laughing. People were falling all over the place. People would try to talk and they couldn't talk. And it wasn't... It wasn't fake because they'd come down to the mall about two hours later and the spirit would hit them in the malls They start falling in the malls. They start laughing in the malls. They get stuck in the malls It shouldn't yeah. be surprising that if the revelation of the father hits so strong mm. the father's love yeah. that we begin to act like children mm. Yes, yes. wow, well, that's so there's good nothing wrong with that yes. right? no, it's, Jesus it's celebrated humbling. that yes, yeah. so pray for us now mm. Would yeah. you start with Duncan and then yeah. Kate? I will do yeah, yeah. pray for yeah. us mm. Yeah, wow Thank you. Wow, Lord Jesus, we're, we're so thankful to you that you came mm. to reveal your Father to us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah. And you said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm. And we thank you that everything that you did on the earth was mm. so that the world could know your daddy, mm. could know the Father. Mm. And so we think about all of the amazing miracles that you did and how the children flocked to you and all of the, you know, Mary loved you so much. And we think about all of the uh, things that you did, multiplying food and walking on water and raising Lazarus and healing lepers and the blind seeing and paralyzed people walking and all the amazing miracles that you did. Mm -hmm. You did them all because... It was your father living in you who did those miracles and you yeah. did it so the world, so that we all could know yeah. that our daddy, our heavenly father is our daddy. Yeah. 
Mm. And he loves us. And he's the most powerful being in and out of the universe. And nothing is impossible for him. And so I ask you right now, you who are not at all like our earthly fathers, Mm -hmm. you who are altogether lovely in every way, you are good, endlessly good. I ask you, Heavenly Father, our daddy, that you would baptize every person Mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. listening Mm -hmm. with your liquid golden honey love through the Holy Spirit, clothing them on the inside and the outside. Mm and revealing your son Jesus to them in an ever increasing joyful revelation, experiential revelation of the son of God. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, Lord, I ask that you would heal every person from their orphan hearted tendencies, just like your healing, continue to heal Kate and I and transforming us from being people with a mentality of an orphan, even though we're born again and we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we still had that orphan heart. But you came, Father, mm. and you touched mm. us and you secured us in your love and you you gave us the spirit of adoption. Would you give mm. every person listening right mm. now mm. that experience of the spirit of adoption? Yes, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that Mm. you have put the spirit within us that cries out, Abba, Daddy, Papa, the most intimate name for you, Father God. Mm. You're not just our creator, you are our dad. You are our daddy today. I ask that you would lead every person Mm. on a journey of being able to forgive their earthly father and even their mother for any way they've misrepresented your heart of yeah. love oh, and you, that we would find our identity secured as a son or a daughter mm. into your heart yes oh, that God. you would um set us oh, on a place yeah. where we are open to receive your love and your fathering mm. that we would become like little children just dependent on your love <sighs> and your grace jesus in every area that we would open up our hearts for all that you want to lavish on us. It says that you want to lavish your love upon us. And so often we just just hold back from love. We're uncomfortable with love. And and God, that's all you're about. You're a God of love. We can't separate you from love. And so as your children, we want to be able to demonstrate not only giving away your love, but receiving love Mm, in this moment. Every heart Mm -hmm. that is starved and feeling needy of love, that you would just come and baptize them, immerse them in that liquid honey love right now, right now over the airwaves. Yes, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Daddy. Mm. The Father's blessing. The Father's That's blessing right. is being released, and it continues to this day. Yeah, How absolutely. can people connect with your yeah. ministry and what you're doing? Well, our ministry is called Catch the Fire now. It's not our ministry. It's the ministry of John and Carol Scattering, and all of building. the Toronto Airport mm-hmm. Christian Fellowship mm-hmm. uh, has gone on to become a church planting movement mm-hmm. because this love, this Trinitarian mm-hmm. love, is is not something to be experienced alone, but it's to be experienced within community. Yes. And um, and so you know we're we've in 2008 we started planting churches all over the world, and uh, now we're we're over 200 churches all over the world. Uh, not all of them have been planted by us, but um, some have joined, etc. And so it's called Catch the Fire. So you can go to. Uh, you know, www.catchthefire.com. We'll yeah. put the link in the description. Yes, and, and you um, can go and yeah. find out all about our ministry. Kate and I have a podcast called Into the Fire. Into the Fire. And uh, we lo- we call it Into the Fire because, you know, the fire of God's love, mm-hmm. but also the reality that life often feels like a fire, the fiery trials that we go through. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. we love, you know, we interview ordinary people, 
we uh, sorry we, we well we interview people that God's used extraordinary, but we talk about some of the ordinary things, if you like, the behind the scenes, mm. so that people can see the journey that they've gone through in both fires, you know, uh, to become who God's mm. made them to be, and and it's a it's an amazing podcast. Yeah, we're based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh, North Carolina, yeah. Carolina grateful church is thriving. to yes. be in North Carolina. Yeah, we yeah. planted that church in two thousand and eight. Actually, that sort of started the yeah. whole church planting. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, dynamic. And so the revival continues yes. through yes. another generation, and we're yeah. just so blessed that, you know, maybe our children weren't aware of mm -hmm. what happened in January. In 1994, but it's the same Holy Spirit the same that Holy is Spirit. on the move right now, yes. setting hearts on fire. And if we don't learn the lessons of the past, that's right. yeah, we're we're doomed to repeat the mistakes and never yeah. see the successes. Yeah, and I think there's so much we can learn from what the Father so did true. at Toronto. So much we can learn, not from yeah. the mistakes, from the successes. Correct. Yes. And uh, we're mm. so thankful you would take the time to mm. sit in these uncomfortable chairs with oh, us. Oh no, they're actually quite comfortable. Yeah, they're quite good, comfortable. Actually. Alan, you've done well. <laughs> and share. Well, thank yeah, you both. Thank, thank you, you both so thank much. You, thank you so much. Hope yeah. to have you back on again yeah, sometime thank soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.